Thank you for joining CareerCert today for our webinar on Narcan administration and the opioid crisis. I'm your host for the webinar, Danielle. At CareerCert, we are focused on providing emergency and healthcare professionals with the training they need to best protect and care for those in their communities. We know that opioid overdose is becoming an increasing concern in the United States. And we are grateful for this opportunity to connect with you to share information that could make a difference. For more critical training and free resources, check out our website at careercert.com. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter for this webinar, Quo Downing Reese. Quo is an 18 year veteran of EMS. She's a critical care paramedic from Rochester, New York, with a degree in EMS management. Quo has years of experience teaching EMS and medical training as a career cert instructor, New York State Certified CIC, NAEMT instructor, and as an AHA Regional Training Center faculty. Quo, I'll let you take it from here. Hello, guys. Welcome to Career Search in the Loxone Administration and the Opioid Crisis. My name is Quo Downing Reese. So I am one of the educators here. I've been in EMS for quite a while, so I've seen a lot of use of naloxone and it's seen its increasing use. So an overview and some objectives. What we are hoping that you get out of this uh, webinar is understanding the different phases and the current conditions of the opioid crisis, what you're gonna see out there in the field. We're gonna describe what naloxone, also known as Narcan is, how it works, why is it used as an antidote for opioid uh, overdose, and how that kind of pharmacokinetics uh, and pharmacology works. We're going to establish when naloxone is indicated and when it's not. I'm not going to always want to just slam Narcan to everybody. Um, and then we're going to discuss airway management of the patient before and after naloxone administration, which is highly, highly important for these patients. We're going to discuss some dosages. There are some positive and negative side effects depending on the dose size that you're using for your patient. And we're going to discuss that in a little bit in more detail. We're going to talk about the different types of routes that you can use for administration. And we are going to talk about some other things that are not necessarily completely about you, but are kind of more legal issues uh, that you may run across, such as the dangers of refusing of transport after you've given naloxone or discuss some, some EMS concerns for you after you've given naloxone your safety or the, the bystander safety, the patient's safety. There has been more use of community naloxone kits and that has some implications on us as in EMS systems. And uh, we'll talk about some protocols that might be based off a systematic review that you may be familiar with Obviously, every location uh, has its own demographics, but we'll talk about some pretty established protocols that you may see. All right, so here's the big question. How many of you have treated a patient with opioid overdose? I would assume that pretty much every single person here, if you've been in EMS for any amount of time, has definitely seen that. Whether it be prescription or illegal drug use, you've at some point encountered a patient with an opiate overdose. What does your department do to help prepare you for these calls? Have you had specific training? What did that training entail? Did it entail difference for BLS providers versus ALS providers? Do you talk about airway management with this type of patient? And do they talk about your safety with this type of patient? This is where you guys can kind of chime in and, and let me know what things have you noticed? What things have you seen that have, have changed over the years, especially for some of you who have been in the field for uh, quite a long time like me, I've definitely seen how we've changed treating the patient with an opiate overdose and, and how our protocols have kind of changed a little with that as well. If we're gonna talk about an opioid crisis, I think we should talk about where did it begin? So opioids, when we talk about that, we're including prescription pain medications, heroin, and synthetic drugs like fentanyl and carfentanil. Prescription medications is that, you know, oxycodone and, and the morphine, those type of medications, fentanyl patches, right? So they may have a prescription, but they may abuse that prescription. From about 1999 to 2017, 
you can see a lot of people died from an overdose involving opioids. Some of those may have been intentional, some may be unintentional. I would say that a good majority of them were inattentional, um, but it has definitely created a crisis for us. And we're gonna kind of outline that in three distinct ways. So wave one, if, if any of you were working in the like late 1990s, you started seeing these opioid deaths involving prescription opioids. So like I said, methadone, hydrocodone, uh, oxycodone, Dilaudid, all these opioids started coming and we started seeing that and it started to increase since at least 1999. So if you've been in the field for 30 some years, you've kind of seen that progression. So wave two, wave two, they're saying that started around 2010. There was a rapid increase in overdose deaths involving heroin. Heroin obviously goes back further than that, but we really started to see an uptick in the amount of deaths that were involved using heroin. And there's many reasons for that. One, we talked about prescription medications. We had a lot of veterans that came back from wars and they uh, unfortunately got addicted to prescription medications. And then when the prescriptions were no longer being filled, some of them did move to heroin. And then you've always had the heroin drug users that are in the community. But we noticed that huge second increase around 2010. So wave three. Wave three is really when we started seeing synthetic opioids start to play a, a really big role in how our patients were getting their opioids. So now we started seeing fentanyl. We started seeing mixing of cutting of heroin where uh, you had different stuff mixed together. Some of them maybe cocaine. Some of them might have even been things like talcum powder. So that wave began around 2013 where we started seeing this big increase in synthetic opioids being made versus just straight heroin coming from the original poppy seed. Okay, so now here we are, 2020. You've probably seen there's been this big wave that involves a really big uptick of this unregulated synthetic drugs. They're just selling it by the ton. Carfentanil, fentanyl, I'm sure if any of you are doing 911 calls, you have probably have been warned of the much stronger strains and, and how they've made it into your communities. And as you can see by the numbers, the amount of overdose deaths are quite high, 130 people plus every day. Again, some of those are going to be from prescription misuse. Some are going to be from heroin. There's going to be synthetics that are involved. You see 2 million people are misusing prescription opioids. You see 81,000 people have used heroin for the first time. These are huge numbers when you think about it. It's actually surprising that we haven't even seen more deaths. There's been more out put of information to the communities that have, I, in my opinion, I think helped. And first responders have definitely been given more information and bringing it to our awareness a little bit more. So naloxone, better known as Narcan to many of us, is going to be used when you have an opiate abuse. Like I said, you may need to use large amount of doses when you have things like cutting with fentanyl or carfentanil. So that's, that's increased. And we're using it and it's becoming used more and more and more. So we're, we're noticing, we're coming on scene and we're finding that patient in respiratory depression and their altered mental status and they're quickly being given Narcan. And those patients, if they're, if they're found soon enough, they do really well. They revive with zero neurological deficits. So the earlier we can give it, the better, which is why they started giving out those community kits or why they started actually prescribing patients that were on opioids, naloxone or Narcan, uh, so they could self-administer or a family member could self-administer. So we got a case study for you. You receive a call, it's 3 a.m. You're given the detailed information of a patient, male, in his 20s, not breathing, no pulse, expected cardiac arrest. The dispatch 
details say, hey, there's a needle in the patient's leg, be, beware. And when you arrive, you find the patient to indeed be not breathing without a pulse. And he shows a slow pulses electrical activity and a PEA rhythm on your cardiac monitor. If we think about how we're going to help this patient, if you believe that it is an opioid overdose, naloxone is going to work by non-selectively and competitively binding to the opiate receptor sites in the brain. Now, it's not actually reversing this whole cycle, but what it does is that it changes the cycle. So both naloxone or an opioid fits in an opioid receptor in the brain. If an opioid fits in there, then you get the bad side effects such as depressed respiratory function and apnea. If you get naloxone in it, then it allows your brain to still breathe. It still says, hey, breathe, get oxygen. So that's the difference. It's not necessarily completely reversing everything, but it's a making your brain go, hey, I can still breathe. If it doesn't have that constant opioid saying, hey, we're slowing everything down, we're going to not feel anything, we're not going to breathe, then you're going to have that relationship. So the naloxone is going to block an opioid from filling that space and creating that depressed respiratory function. Naloxone, how is it distributed throughout the body? It actually gets quickly distributed throughout the body. It does vary depending on how you give it, which we will get into. The half-life is generally around 30 minutes to half an hour. So when I say half-life, what I mean is for half of that drug to be absorbed and be used in your body, how long does that take? So that takes uh, generally 30 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on the way that it was given. And redosing of Narcan may be necessary because the opioid that was used may be stronger and the half-life of the opioid is longer than the half-life of Narcan. Therefore, if I use my Narcan and let's say 45 minutes, it's kind of halfway gone. Now the opioid has more floating around to fall into those receptors and then your brain's going to start getting those opioid receptors triggered by the opioid versus the naloxone. So sometimes you have to redose the naloxone to push out those opioid receptor sites to pick up naloxone instead of the opioid. So heroin, highly addictive. The thing about heroin is it gives you a huge high. It's almost an instant high. If you ask any, any user why they use heroin and why they can't get away from it. So that first initial high that they get from heroin, they're always trying to search for it again. And that's why it becomes so highly addictive. That feeling of euphoria that they got when they used heroin for the first time, they're always kind of searching for that same high. Heroin, like I said before, is from morphine of the opium poppy plant. So that's how heroin is created. And as we all know, it can be mixed with other drugs, um, fentanyl or carfentanil being two of the main ones that you may find or hear about. It really increases that analgesic effect, that high effect that they get. However, fentanyl and carfentanil are also gonna be causing respiratory depression or apnea. So there are some definite downsides to the increase of cutting with other drugs. You may see heroin used with cocaine, that's known as speedballing. Keep all that in, in the back of your head, that heroin uh, a lot of times is never pure. There's something cut with it, whether it's talcum powder, fentanyl, cocaine. A lot of times you're not going to get just heroin. So fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid pain reliever, so it is not, it's not natural. Someone had to process it and make it. It was approved for treating severe pain. It is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. So you give your patient, you know, five of morphine versus 50 micrograms of fentanyl, you, they should have a much, much more analgesic effect with the fentanyl versus the morphine. The morphine we usually give in milligrams versus fentanyl, we give in 
uh, micrograms. So you can see the, the difference in the concentration there. We're giving much smaller doses of fentanyl because it is so much more potent. Car fentanyl is also going to be synthetic. It is 10,000 times more potent than morphine. Generally, you will need multiple multiple doses of Narcan to reverse the effects of carfentanil. I've seen patients get in excess of like 16 milligrams of Narcan before they've gotten a reversal uh, when carfentanil was present. The reason why these dealers are are cutting their pure heroin for, for fentanyl and carfentanil, it's all about money. It's cheaper much, much cheaper for you to make fentanyl or carfentanil by the synthetic than it is to do heroin. And if you look at that little picture, that small itty bitty little rock in the carfentanil is still probably going to be even more powerful than that whole bunch of stuff there in the bottom of the heroin vial. I mean, you see how the fentanyl also uh, much, much less, uh, absorbently amount of less. So I can cut my heroin with a little bit of fentanyl or a little bit of carfentanil, and I don't have to give as much of the heroin, and they're still gonna get the same amount of high or even more. Now, carfentanil initially was supposed to be used, and it was designed for uh, analgesia for large mammals, such as uh, an elephant or you know something that weighs over a ton. Then it would make sense, because that would mean I would have to give a ton, a ton, a ton of fentanyl or morphine for that to work. Fentanyl, if you do it on a weight-based system, you could see how you would end up having to give huge numbers of fentanyl. So that's why carfentanil was made. But of course, like many drugs that have uh, made it past the FDA, it ends up getting abused. So one of the things that you wanna be very cognizant of when we talk about opioids is situational awareness. If you're on scene, you're working that 20 year old male that we had dispatched to us and you show up, you find a needle in his leg and you see some white powdery substance on a table and you see a spoon and stuff. Don't touch the white powdery substance. Don't put your gear on it. Avoid that area at all costs if possible. Move your patient away if you need to. The smallest amount of carfentanil, if it comes in contact with your skin, you as the responder are now at risk of being an overdose. So you could become a patient yourself. So be very vigilant about any kind of white powder that may be on scene. It has happened where first responders have gone to do their job and then they thus now become uh, a patient. And you can see it when you look at this penny, the fatal dose of fentanyl versus the fatal dose of carfentanil and just that little speck could touch you and could potentially kill you. And you need to be aware of, of where you are putting all of your equipment and your gear. Cause let's say you put your, your med bag down on top of it and you work the whole scene and you're taking your med bag out now to carry towards the rig and that's when you get in contact. So you have to be very careful where you're placing things and what you're doing. Not all gloves are safe for uh, carfentanil or fentanyl. Some gloves would still allow that to penetrate through and could potentially still cause you to overdose. So be aware of that. Even a gloved hand may not be sufficient enough PPE. Okay, so let's get into opioids effects. I've already said that whole depressed respiratory rate. And when I say depressed respiratory rate, I mean this patient is gonna look like they're barely breathing, if at all, maybe four times a minute, if that, they kind of have sometimes that, uh, what I like to call a guppy breath, where they, they take that, <gasps> and then there's just a huge pause, and you're just, everyone's waiting, 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 <gasps> and that's all you're seeing, right? Or you may walk up and find that they're not breathing at all. They may be completely hypoxic, blue in the face, cyanotic. You may find them in, you know, that's what we call respiratory arrest, or you may even find them if they haven't been breathing long enough, they've, they have gotten into a severe hypoxia, you may find them in cardiac arrest. 
Generally, I find as long as it hasn't been cut with uh, cocaine, usually we find some kind of bradycardic rhythm, a PEA or a systole. So it usually kind of goes in that route. It goes bradycardic rhythm from the hypoxia, then you get a PEA, and then you go into a systole. So wherever you find them in that chain is generally what I see when I see a patient that goes into cardiac arrest due to a respiratory problem. Your focus should be airway and ventilation. That is your primary focus. Yes, of course, if they don't have a pulse, you're going to start compressions and all that, but you'll probably find that the best thing that you can do for them is ventilate that patient. Open their airway and get them breathing. Something to note for you ALS providers, be cautious of dropping an advanced airway when we're administering naloxone. So I know as a paramedic, when I came out straight out of the class, you, you want to intubate. This is a new skill. This is something that is really new and, and an advanced treatment that you can do. And you, you want to get in there and intubate as many people as possible. Be aware, though, that what may happen is, is that if you believe that it's an opiate overdose, you start an advanced airway such as an endotracheal tube, you give the naloxone after you've gotten your IV, now your patient suddenly wakes up and what's the first thing they usually want to do is grab the tube and pull it out. In that instance, you're kind of risking them causing damage to their airway because you inflated that cuff. So be cognizant of that. Uh, that's not my first go-to for advanced airway or even just airway management of that patient. Just like this gentleman here, that NPA in the nose, perfect. Get the bag mask on top of his face. Start ventilating him at an appropriate rate of about 12 with high flow oxygen. And I would ride that out after you know several doses of naloxone. It, that's even needed before I would even consider putting an advanced airway in, even if they're in cardiac arrest. So airway adjunct selection. Open that airway. Do you think that there's trauma? Do you not think that there's trauma? Personally, I don't uh, generally go with the OPA. I usually go with an NPA just because they sometimes still have a gag reflex and I really don't want them to vomit. I'd rather control their airway on a kind of more of a basic level uh, using just uh, an MPA, some oxygen, maybe even a nasal capno underneath the, the bag valve mask. But use the appropriate side adjunct for, for whatever patient you're using. If they have that really big floppy tongue and you need to get it out of the way to open the airway, then by all means, if an OPA goes in and you accept it, use an OPA. You can use both an OPA and an NPA. That is definitely more than okay to do that to make sure that that patient is adequately oxygenating. So respiratory compromise, that's really the biggest thing about this resuscitation. you got a patient, if they don't have a pulse, my thing is not about shocking them. Most times they're not in a shockable rhythm, but if they are, obviously I would. My biggest concern though is getting them to breathe. So I need to open that airway. I need to ventilate with appropriate size BBMs. If you need your PEEP valve, we personally, in my area, we use a pediatric BBM with a PEEP valve. And we usually start at around five. I use an MPA first, nasal capno underneath that with oxygen, and then my bag valve mask, my pediatric bag valve mask with a PEEP valve is what we use. That is my first line treatment. My next treatment would be getting that IV and I'll put them on a cardiac monitor if there's no pulse. But like I said, generally, it's not a defibrillating type of rhythm. If it is, defibrillate, get your IV, and then start looking into Narcan. Again, perhaps wait a little bit on that advanced airway support and see if you, if you get them uh, back after you've given one or two doses of Narcan before you uh, consider that advanced airway like an endotracheal tube. You're going to use naloxone if you believe or suspect that there may be some kind of opiate overdose, whether it is by prescription medication or an illegal substance. You can use it if it's unknown, but possible. You came in, you found a patient, they have respiratory depression, they're either unresponsive or they seem altered, and that big, big one that we look for is constricted pupils. 
And then last, is there drug paraphernalia on scene? Like I said, if the needle's still sticking out of their leg, there's a high likelihood that they abused. You might not know for a fact that it was an opiate overdose, but there's a high suspicion of it. You've got this, you know, young male slumped over in the car or, or uh, friends or bystanders on scene, family. Hey, he's known to use heroin. They just found him like that. That's when, when it's indicated. So let's talk about the routes. So you've got the intranasal administration. That's a very easy way. You, you need to have some kind of uh, way to have an atomizer, a mucosal atomizer on it, or it may be one of those self-inject that you just pinch once and it just injects it all intranasally. The kits that the community gets, a lot of them get intranasal administration. Our fire department carries an intranasal administration, auto-injector naloxone. They give four milligrams auto, just one nostril, boom, done. You have your IO administration. Again, maybe you find this patient in cardiac arrest. You can do the, your IO. Uh, if you're looking at an adult and you're doing an IO, I would say, if possible, go for that right humoral head. It will be a much more effective and it will be a lot quicker administration. And you'll see the effects much better than if you do a tibial IO. Intramuscular IM. Again, a little bit slower in the absorption of naloxone, so that's going to take a little longer for you to see effects, probably more to like five minutes, versus your IV route, that you'll see usually within one to two minutes, you'll see a, a difference. The intranasal, probably similar to the intramuscular, maybe just slightly faster than the intramuscular. In intraosseous, it really depends on your placement, where it was, and if they're in full cardiac arrest or not. If you do that right humoral head, then it's fairly equivalent to the IV. So you want to be more central versus peripheral when you're giving this drug. So let's talk about dosing really quick. The dose range can range anywhere from 0 0.04 milligrams to 4 milligrams. As I said, uh, me as a, a provider, and I'm a critical care paramedic, I would start out always with the 0 0.04 milligrams. Our fire department, however, they don't carry vials. They carry a, an auto injector and it automatically is four milligrams. Our police department also carries the same thing and it's four milligrams. So automatically they, that's what they would get if those providers showed up before me. If I show up, I always say, hey, hey, let's wait. Let me give an IV. It's going to work better. And I give them the 0 0.04. And then I can repeat doses up to two milligrams at a time every five minutes. Give it time. Let it take time to get into the patient system. One to two minutes, continue breathing for them. Continue that ventilation while you're waiting for that medication to work and you're starting to see hopefully signs of them spontaneously breathing faster. You can give it down the endotracheal tube. However, that is going to be a very long time for you to see the effect. I don't recommend doing it that way, but if that was the only way that you could do it, then by all means, that's pretty much gone to the wayside, though, now that most systems carry an intranasal version. Naloxone dosing, most BLS providers, so if you're an EMT basic, Many of you, your protocols are going to call for an initial two milligrams uh, intranasal, one in each nostril, one milligram in each nostril, or you may carry like that, uh, my fire police department, a four milligram naloxone intranasal single dose injector. Again, give it at least five minutes for, for results. I know it's going to feel like eternity when that patient's not breathing appropriately, their whole face is blue, but it, it does take a little bit of time, but you will see the results. And I'm going to share why you don't want to just keep giving doses after doses after doses every minute or so that you want to give it time to, to work. And again, we talked about it, that endotracheal tube or supraglottic airway is going to take a long time to deliver because you're going to have to bag that into the lungs and then the lungs are going to have to absorb it. And it's going to have to cross the blood brain barrier into the blood system through the capillaries. So it's, it's going to definitely take a while. So that's not really our route that we want to use very often. You can use it, but there are much better delivery routes. So the max dose generally for, for most systems is going to be 10 milligrams. Once I've given 10 milligrams, then I kind of have maxed out. If you are in an area where you have a very long transport time, maybe your, your protocols are different. 
you may have to contact med control. So I can give up to 10 milligrams without contacting med control. It's a standing order. If I want to give more than 10 milligrams, then I need to call med control and discuss the, the patient situation and, and why, what I've done so far, what I'm seeing, uh, what's going on. I've had a patient, it was actually an elderly woman so not someone that you would suspect to be an opiate overdose, but a, an elderly woman. She was in cardiac arrest, and it took uh, 16 milligrams of naloxone to get pulses back and to get her spontaneously breathing. She overdosed on prescription medications. She had a history of uh, dementia and just kept taking medication, not realizing that she already took it. So that was uh, unfortunate, but that was a time that I've had to exceed 10 milligrams. And you may also run into that if you have fentanyl or carfentanil in the heroin in your area. So give those doses five minutes apart, let the medication work, make sure that you're breathing for them if needed, do compressions, defibrillations, just like you would, and then just add naloxone into your ACLS as you're, as you're doing your rounds of medication. Local protocols, like I said, they may vary. If you have a long transport time versus your urban city like me, I, I've worked pretty much always where my hospital is no more than 10 minutes from me, usually much closer than that. And when I worked in Los Angeles County, I did have some longer transport, but generally speaking, I didn't have an issue where I needed to give more than 10 milligrams. That's an absorbently high amount of naloxone given within a short amount of time. Basic airway measures should be part of your protocol. Like I said, opening up that airway, either with a head tilt, chin lift, if you don't think there's trauma, if you need to do a modified jaw thrust, get in that airway adjunct, your MPAs, your OPAs. Again, I prefer an MPA, but there's nothing wrong with using an OPA. Manually ventilating that patient with a BVM on high flow oxygen is probably one of the best things that you're gonna do for them after you've opened their airway. That is what's going to reverse that hypoxia that their body is lacking. And that's how you're going to keep them from having neurological deficits. Give your dose up to the 10 milligrams max. If you need more, med control should be contacted. And our goal is not to get the patient awake, alert, and talking to me. My goal is just to have them breathe at an appropriate rate and depth. I want to see oxygenation and ventilation. I do not need them to be awake, alert, and talking to me. You'll find that when these people wake up, they're not happy. You took their high away. Now they may become combative. So now your safety becomes an issue. I've had patients come up swinging. You can have patients that come up projectile vomiting. Really, my goal is not about getting a person to be able to talk to me and tell me everything that they did. If it works, then I know that they did some opiate. It doesn't matter what opiate was. I just know that it that Narcan worked. All I need to see is a reversal of the respiratory depression. Are they able to now breathe spontaneously on their own at an appropriate rate and depth? Ten a minute, I'm happy. So what are your, your protocols? Think about your protocols. Has this webinar giving you some insight on some things that might need changing in your protocols? Is that something that you need to bring up to your clinical directors? What kind of airwaves should be instituted in your protocols? At what level provider can you give naloxone and which routes can be given? In my protocol, an EMT basic can give both intranasal and IN so they can give intramuscular. Our ALS providers are the ones who could do either an IO or an IV route. So we go back to our gentleman and what do we do for him? We found him, 20 year old male, needle still in his leg. He had no pulse. He had uh, no respirations and uh, we see constricted pupils. My first thing I'm gonna do I'm going to give him oxygen. So I'm going to open up that airway. I'm going to put in some kind of adjunct and I'm going to get him on that high flow oxygen with the BVM. What's the next thing I'm going to do? I'm going to quickly put him on the cardiac monitor, see if there's a rhythm I can defibrillate. Generally, it's not. So I want to get my IV and I want to give him that naloxone. So there are risks. So I keep talking about dosing. Why do I talk about dosing? There are some risks depending on the amount that you give. 
So I, as an ALS provider, I prefer to give the 0.04 milligrams IV. When you hit somebody with four milligrams all at once, you can have some side effects such as flash pulmonary edema. So all of a sudden now you're going to have their lungs filling with fluid. There's this huge catecholamine release, and that's what increases the cardiovascular blood volume and can cause those dysrhythmias. So now they may, you, they were bradycardic when you found them, and now after you've given them that four milligrams of naloxone, now they're all of a sudden tachycardic when they wake and that increases also the pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. That's what causes that pulmonary edema. So whenever you can, lower doses should be given. So if you're a BLS provider and the only way that they provide you naloxone is in a four milligram auto injector, perhaps you might want to discuss that with your clinical department and see if there is a way that you can give a smaller amount. It is available in a smaller amount. Is there a reason why you're only giving it in four milligram auto injectors versus being able to give it in a two milligram or even less? And remember our goal is about respiration and ventilation and oxygenation. So I don't want those negative side effects of flash pulmonary edema. So there is a ton of lists of side effects of Narcan use. Like I said, they wake up, they're mad, you took their high away. They may be very aggressive. Confusion is also generally, they're, they're gonna deny all day long. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I was fine, I was sleeping, I, I was just sitting here. They tend to be confused. They don't really know what's going on. It's like just waking up from a really, really deep sleep and then all of a sudden, wham, you're awake. Now they're tachycardic that big catecholamine release makes them nauseous and they may vomit and generally it's projectile vomit. So, you know, be ready to move if you're slamming large amounts of Narcan. That was one thing that I learned as a paramedic student was if you're going to slam Narcan, be ready to jump back and move from the vomit or the swinging of the patient's fists. Because of the catecholamine release, you're now going to have an increase in blood pressure. A lot of them will complain of headache or their body hurts. We talked about how they can have pulmonary edema and how that happens because of the catecholamine release. They're at risk because of all of that uh, fluid of aspirational pneumonia. So great, you fixed the patient from their opiate overdose and now you've hospitalized them in the ICU with aspiration pneumonia. That's never gonna be our, our goal. Our goal is to obviously have a patient be able to walk out of the hospital fairly soon within a couple hours and they're gonna be neurologically intact with no other side effects. You can see seizure and you can also see cardiac dysrhythmia, whether it is tachycardia, bradycardia, PVCs, SVT, kind of depends on what is cut with that opioid. So if a patient is given Narcan they wake up, they're now fully alert and oriented. Can they sign off in your system? Can they go uh, AMA against medical advice? There is some legal responsibility for you as the provider. Understand, we talked about this earlier, that the opioid may have a longer half-life than the naloxone that you just administered. So sure, they're alert, they're oriented, they feel great now, all of their bottles are now within normal limits. And they say, no, I don't wanna to go to the hospital. I don't have the money to go to the hospital. I don't have insurance, whatever their excuse is. Do you feel comfortable letting them sign off? Do you have to contact med control for that to happen? So those are some legal implications that you may wanna consider before you let that patient sign AMA. They may be alert and oriented at that time, but understand that whatever opioid they did could last longer than the naloxone dose that you gave. Therefore, this patient at this particular point may be fine, but within 30 minutes, maybe right back to where they were when you found them initially. So patient refusal is kind of a very slippery slope. Keep that in mind when that patient says, no, no, I don't wanna go anymore. Some places have policies where the police department is called for any kind of overdose call. And a lot of times our police officers will do a mental hygiene arrest. They will not give the patient the option to refuse. They must be seen at the hospital per PD. They have to be transported to the hospital and seen. So they will pull them under a mental health arrest so that they will be seen and monitored for several hours by the hospital. Look into your system and think about how you guys handle refusals after given Narcan. 
So you should ascertain if Narcan administration was done before you got there. Remember I talked about those community Narcan kits. So the community has been given these, these little kits that have gloves, a vial of Narcan or an auto injector. And it says, you know, hey, if this, you find a person who's not responsive, they're not breathing, uh, you're not sure if they have a pulse, you can give this Narcan into their nose. So you may find that uh, Narcan was administered by a bystander prior to your arrival. You also may find that fire did it before you got there or police did it before you got there. Who started high flow oxygen? Maybe again, fire a lot of times, if they get there first, they'll start bagging the patient for us before we get there. If their respiratory status doesn't improve after they've given it, so if I get there, let's say fire beat me by two minutes. They got there, they gave their four milligrams of Narcan. I show up now two minutes later. So I haven't given them the full five minutes for that Narcan to work. I'm going to wait three more minutes watching that the ventilatory status is, is being monitored. We're providing them high flow oxygen with that BBM. In three minutes, I'm going to go, hmm, he hasn't improved. Now I'm going to go ahead and administer my own Narcan based on my protocol, which again, I would prefer to do it by IV. And always be vigilant of your scene. Remember for the powder, looking for that. Does the patient have any weapons on them? While they're not awake and alert, now's a good time to search their body for weapons. I have had that happen. So just little things to be aware of. Again, I don't care if they wake up. I just want them to breathe appropriately. In conclusion, we talked about a lot of things. These are my big key points, though. Provide high quality manual ventilation with high flow oxygen to any patient with respiratory depression, regardless of if it's an opioid overdose or not. It doesn't matter if it's prescription drugs, it doesn't matter if it's an illegal drug, it doesn't matter if you don't see any drugs at all. Provide high quality manual ventilation with high flow oxygen is the biggest thing that you can do to help that patient get them out of that hypoxic state that they're in. And a lot of times you may see if you just appropriately ventilate that patient with airway adjunct like an MPA and a BVM, you'll see that these patients will start breathing spontaneously on their own. And that's all they needed. It was just a higher concentration of oxygen. They were hypoxic. If needed, initiate standard life-saving protocols for any patient in cardiac arrest. So if they are indeed also in full cardiac arrest, not just respiratory arrest, then by all means, yes, implement all of your ACLS, CLS, whatever level you have, and initiate those protocols. Go ahead and, and get your IV. Look to see if you need to defibrillate. Give your epi, all of that kind of stuff. Be aware, though, you're giving epi, and then you're also going to have a catecholamine release of norepi and epi when you give naloxone. So just be aware that you're doing both. So you may get a really high blood pressure or heart rate if you get ROSC. Be very careful of where you are on scene, who's on scene, bystanders, where are they? Is there any drug-related paraphernalia? Watch out for uncapped needles. That's another big safety risk. Look for that white powder on scene. Be careful of where you place your, your equipment and yourself. We, as the first-line providers, we're going to see the most of these patients, and we're the ones who are going to treat these patients. Our quick delivery of patient care, if it's adequate, is what's going to really change and impact this patient. It's not usually what happens at the hospital. At the hospital, they just monitor them after we've given them naloxone to make sure that the half-life doesn't wear off before the opioid's half-life. We made the huge difference in saving that person's life by providing quick, high-quality manual ventilation with high flow oxygen, naloxone administration quickly at an appropriate dose, and an appropriate route, and that's what's gonna really help you for this opioid crisis. And those are kind of the key takeaway points that I want you to think about. So there's obviously some of the references of where I got this information. 
please feel free to comment or email us with any questions that you have in regards to this webinar. I appreciate all of your guys' time. And I know that we're all very busy, especially with what's going on currently in the world. So I appreciate you tuning in and we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this important conversation on Narcan administration. We would love to continue the conversation with you. Visit us at careercert.com for more webinars and free resources to help prepare you to best protect yourself, your fellow providers, and your patients. Thank you again for connecting with us today. And thank you for your sacrifice to make our communities safer places.